<laughs> subscriber. Oh, very cool. Thank you very much. Can I take What's a your name? picture of you? Sure, sure. Oh, oh, I'm Yannick. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I know you. <laughs> okay, well. Hey, everyone knows you. Hi, Hi. Hi I'm Yannick. Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you. I know your videos. Yeah, I've seen your videos. Yeah. There we go. Another day, another poster session. Let's find some interesting people. Um. Hello. Okay. Hello, Yannick. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Yannick. Hello. Nice meeting you. I'm doing a bit of recording. Is it okay if I yeah, uh, record yeah. this? Okay. Very oh, cool. Are you a YouTuber? I, I sometimes, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I think I saw. I try. You. Would you care to? Explain to people a little bit what you're doing. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I have no, no clue what, what is temporal action segmentation. Ah, okay. So the task of temporal segmentation is a task to translate an untrimmed video into action segments, which means that the neural network wants to frame-wise classify the action labels of each frame. Okay. Yeah. So, so like this, like... Yes, that's great. Okay. So the problem of the existing models yeah. is that they often suffer from the out-of-context errors, which means that in this sequence, the app mustard is not really necessary actions for making a coffee. But the existing neural network often too concentrate to the visual features, yeah. and they of, uh, the, and they uh, do not distinguish between spoon sugar and add mustard. So in these kind of problems, we want to refine. Uh, out of context errors to fit in the activity context. But is is the person in the video actually adding mustard and it's just not important or is it a mistake? It is, this one is uh, just a mistake. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So our goal is to include the, the context of the whole thing yeah. in the prediction, not yeah. just do like frame by frame prediction. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. I, so it's a like a temporal consistency. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and in here, our contribution is fourfold. We propose an activity grammar induction algorithm mm -hmm. due to Curry, and we uh, propose an effective parser to BP. Yeah. Uh, for so in the data set, we extract those rules as a grammar. Yeah. And with that grammar, this parser uh, aims to find the optimal action sequences which fit to the neural network output. Okay. Yeah. And uh, and and then, so the segmentation optimization process finds the the optimal uh, durations of the action sequences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the, so the grammar you just learn from the data set because the data set has yeah. annotated yeah. things. And the, so, could you recognize? activities that don't appear in the data set. I'm wondering a bit how this handles out of distribution stuff. Like, what if you get the grammar wrong? Ah, uh, so our grammar yeah. is really, really, uh, it's really good at generalization. Okay. So it can cover the unseen action sequences, yeah. but it can refine those out of context errors fit into the activity grammar. Okay. So it can cover out of this distribution. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And then how do you, how does this optimization work? Because uh, I, I feel that this is a tricky part. No? Uh, yeah, this one is, uh, we apply from the this original paper GP. Yeah. And this is a dynamic programming. So okay. based on the probability of this, of the temperature segmentation, it just find the optimal, pro uh, uh, yes, it, optimize action probabilities fit into the this kind of action segments. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So you take this from somewhere and your contribution is you combine all of this into a pipeline or uh, is... no, we introduce this yeah. kind of effective uh, activity grammar. Okay, so the grammar we, itself. The existing yeah. grammar there are too simple. Oh, their grammar is too simple. Okay. But uh, what And this is fully to... learned or uh, this is not learned. This yeah. is just induction algorithm. Okay. So in our activity grammar, there are uh, th this activity grammar is based on probabilistic context-free grammar, mm -hmm. and there are four components: the variables and terminals and rules and the star symbol. Yeah. 
And for the rules, there are two types of rules. Yeah. So the first one is the end rule, and the second one is the or rule. Mm -hmm. So the, in this end rule, there are which means that there are fixed temporal orders between actions. Okay. Yeah. So in here, so for example, and take up and pour coffee. Mm -hmm. So take up must occur before pour coffee. So these kind of relations become end rule A and B. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yes. And for the orders. There are no fixed temporal orders between actions. So, for example, pour coffee and spoon sugar and stir coffee. So these actions can switch to each other. Yeah. For example, in these uh, action sequences. Yeah. So based on these two act two types of rules, uh, we propose key actions and temporal dependencies. So we hypothesize that key actions are actions that consistently present in training action sequences. Yeah. And given those key actions, we find those temporal relations of the uh, training action sequences. Mm -hmm. So in the resulting grammar, we have those hierarchical, uh, we can see the hierarchical structure of the grammar. Yeah. So take up uh, always happen before those other actions. Yeah. And we also introduce the recursive rules in these OR rules which makes the grammar is more generalized to unseen action sequences. Mm -hmm. So it can recursively generate and expand the action sequences, not only seen from the training action sequences. So uh, yeah, for the results, so we apply these kind of novel activity grammar induction algorithm to existing uh, uh, existing model. Yeah. And these are the, base, uh, the other types of grammars, existing mm -hmm. grammars. And we show that our, uh, by applying our approach, the baseline uh, performance improves months, improves mm -hmm. for the two data sets. And we also find that uh, in the qualitative results, uh, we can uh, effectively remove those out of context errors. Because, uh, for example, in the making of scrambled egg, the baseline is formal model, which is the temporal action segmentation model, often fail to consider the global relations in here. Okay. Like, but uh, by using our grammar, we can remove those kind of unnecessary actions in here. Do you do you think for now you need a data set where the actions are you know individual items here? Do do you think you could ever parse these things out of just a description? Like if some you have a YouTube video and someone is making breakfast and they just kind of talk about what they do, uh -huh. do you think it's it's possible to extract yeah, these occurred. kind of actions from to do the whole process, but not having sort of fixed labels? But I think it can be of, possible yeah. because uh, those rules are really generalable, generalized to yeah. actions. Yeah. So it. Uh, does not have happen to be really fixed uh, yes. durations, but what we need for this grammar is just temporal orders of the video. So mm -hmm. I can, I think it might be okay. Applied. Because I mean, this YouTube and so they have algorithms to annotate the video into different sections yeah, of yeah. what's happening. So yeah. this could be really useful in making that a lot better. Sort of these automatic chapters and so on. Very cool. Thank you. I think thank you I'm a subscriber. <laughs> oh, very cool. Thank you very much. Can I take What's a name? picture of you? Sure, sure. <laughs> Is it okay if I record it? Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Okay. Hi. Sorry, I'm Yannick. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I know you. <laughs> okay, well. Hey, everyone knows you. <laughs> cool. Okay. So the current paradigm to perception is like so we're training a discriminator model, which is modeling P of Y given X. Uh, I mean, so you can also hear by the way. By discriminative yeah, yeah, yeah. model, you mean some sort of classifier. Yeah, some sort of classifier, like ResNet, VID, or CLIP, which directly models P of Y given X. Yeah. An alternate approach to perception is to invert a generator model. Let's say if you have like stable diffusion or something like that, then you simply, so generator models model P of X given Y, and you can apply Bayes rule yeah. to get P of Y given X, which is basically searching for Y so that you can generate input image yeah. X. Mm -hmm. Now, and we studied this in our previous paper, diffusion classifier. So there are like different trade-offs of discriminative and generative approach to perception. So discriminative approaches learn a bottom-up mapping and generative models learn a top-down mapping. So they learn like different uh, statistics of the same data distribution. But discriminative models better fit to the training set. So for example, if you just compare the ImageNet accuracy on like an ImageNet pre-trained uh, discriminative model, 
it'll be like something in 86 87 but if you take the sota state of the art generator model and if you invert it you will get something like 78 77 so they better fit to the training set because they're obviously optimizing for the same objective but the interesting property of generator models is that they better generalize outside of the training set and this is because discriminator models learn like these shortcut pathways so that they can fit to the training distribution really well but generator models because they are not directly modeling that objective they probably like end up generalizing better and miss on these shortcut pathways so in this paper we asked the question how can you get best of both worlds that is the better discriminator ability of discriminator models and better generalization ability of generator models or better better fitting ability of discriminator model and better generalization ability of generator models so the idea is simple given an input image x pass it to the discriminator model you get like some class probabilities if it's a classifier which is task output y and generator model expects like a pretrained generator model expects like some class embedding as input so the class embedding that it's getting inputted during training is like you can think of it as like Uh, a one hot probability over all the possible class embedding so you can simply replace that one hot with this soft probability of the discriminator model and then you still do the weighted average and you you get something in distribution so you there's no like a uh, shift in terms of like the what they expect so then you get like an auto encoder type architecture where the encoder is the discriminator model and the decoder is the generator model you improve our and you can back prop the diffusion loss to update both the discriminator model and the generator model so a generation looks up, so our results look something like this so let's assume the input image is a goose and the classifier outputs let's say a sea lion and then you're conditioning this class probability to the generator model and trying to generate back the image but it generates something not similar to a goose but then you compare like the loss between both of them like a denoising loss and you back propagate to update both of them so now they have to change their prediction so that they can generate back the image image back and so the classifier starts predicting a goose and the generator model is able to generate back the image so we show with this idea you can simply improve you, like you, you the, do this during inference or during training during inference during so during inference. training we use just pretrained models okay so so basically we are adapting at test time like training yeah. at test time yeah So here we show that at test time by doing single example adaptation like adapting each example independently you can improve like the best clip classifiers by a few points while using stable diffusion as your generator model. And in ImageNet case where you're using ImageNet pretrained discriminator models you can i- improve them while using image best ImageNet pretrained uh, generator models like DIT and stuff like that. So here we show that in online adaptation results where you're adapting in a streaming manner you can improve convex slash by 20 points or so. while just adapting them in an online manner and here we What show that what does that mean adapting them in an online manner so in an online manner you see an example you yeah. adapt both of them and then when you see the next example you don't reset your weights you don't go back to the pretrained okay. initial you just keep adapting yeah so you're somehow accumulating information that you have learned as you're seeing the examples I, so the, the back prop during test time actually changes the way yeah 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 of the, so yeah so okay. back prop during test time in single sample we adapt both of them but then we reset for each sample yeah. because yeah. we don't want to share information okay So here we show that in online you can get significant improvement, and then on ImageNet C we can show that you can outperform like these previous uh, test time adaptation methods like TENT and TTT MAE by a significant margin by just doing this new idea of adapting using a diffusion loss instead of using entropy or let's say in this case like a MAE based loss. So what what's the actual thing that's so you have a diffusion loss. You're trying to predict again the noise that you started with. Yeah, no. So, so, oh. so this is like a proper diffusion loss. You just sample yeah. a, a noise at like different uh, levels of, like different at different time steps. Yeah. Uh, you just noise the image and then you try to denoise it. So it's like proper I diffusion see, loss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just like right now in, in proper diffusion loss, the conditioning C is like the ground truth label of the image. So now the it's not ground truth label it's just the output of the classifier let's say okay and we show the same results even like on other tasks like segmentation and depth prediction because the idea is like very general like if you have a text condition depth condition or let's say a segmentation condition diffusion model you can update their respective classifiers so the idea is if i am really bad at denoising the image it might be because the classifier gave me the wrong label yeah basically and because i back prof i tell the classifier Well, if this was a goose, I could denoise yeah, it yeah, a lot yeah, better, yeah, yeah, exactly. and then yes. that could yeah. update its class. Yeah, yeah. So why do you then backcrop through this and not just kind of stop here and yeah, update that's a, the that's label? Yeah, that's a good result. So if you just backcrop and update here, then you'll get something like this. Then, yeah. Okay. And and then you will again get like poor fitting to the training distribution, right? Okay. But what we want is like we want it to adapt this, and the reason is because like let's say. If the classifier thinks the classifier has like a strong prior on what it thinks the image has, yeah. 
and let's say this is a rabbit, but the generator model, let's say, is saying that hey, no, it's a lion, and it's tra trying to tell the classifier that it's a lion, but it's just because it's strong prior, and lion is the wrong class, let's say, because it's a strong, like strong initialize, it's just very difficult for it to update the lion, yeah. update it saying that it's lion. But maybe if it's saying something that it's not sure of, it's not sure between rabbit and a cat, let's say, and if it's saying it's cat, then it's easy to update the cat. So it's like somehow like when both of them are pretty much agreeing like not entirely like they, yeah. if one is like entirely disagreeing with the other then you just can't update them yeah. but they're like very close to agreement then updating them becomes easier and what is what what if you didn't do this during test time but actually this was a training procedure yes yeah, so, so, would so, you expect something yeah so, so that is like our, that, that is what like the main goal is the yeah. next this was the, the, the reason we did this is because if you, if you okay if you do this during tra training time it's just like very hard engineering problem okay uh because you have to somehow match the performance of these okay and and improve them so that's why we consider it as an adaptation thing because of the engineering simplicity because we don't want to start with a good initialization but like yeah the ideal thing is like we want like a model that you do during training time you train using generative and discriminative losses and you can get best of both worlds but the, my question is if you did this because you could just do this on the pre-trained models but updating them but you do it on the training set instead of the test at test time right? we do it at test time oh you're saying exactly. do the same thing if at training you do it set. at training set would you expect something yeah, yeah. like would you expect there to be a difference between the online adaptation here and doing this at training time just because of the fact that i don't know there's a train test split or something so so we, we show results on imagenet and on imagenet we can improve these classifiers yeah so I agree, like, I mean, I agree, like, uh, I mean, we haven't still tried it, uh, but the, the only thing I'm worried of is like a collapse where the generator model, let's say, overpowers the discriminator model some way because you're really like want to fine tune them. Yeah. So you need to somehow regularize so that they, they stay close to their predictions and you're getting the generator part. Yeah. So maybe like some form of regularization here saying that, hey, stay close to your predictions, but still try to get uh, like, it, like, yeah, but, but that is like the right thing to do. Okay. So very cool. Training time. Cool, cool. Thanks. Super cool. Thanks thank, a lot. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the videos. Thank you. I'm uh, reporting a bit. Is it okay, okay if I record here? Okay. I I have no clue of uh, sample complexity in recurrent neural networks. Could you explain a little bit what you did? Of course. So the work is about uh, how many data points or samples in or you need in order to train a recurrent neural net. So what yeah. is a recurrent neural net? It's a network that is used for, for example, classification of sequences. Yeah. Let's say we have a sequence of length t. t is the length of the sequence. Yeah. And w is the number of parameters that your network has. Yeah. So the question is that how does the number of samples you need grow as the sequence length grows? Okay. And we showed something interesting that if you consider that the usual deterministic neural net like the weights and everything are real value. Yeah. Then you the the number of samples is linear in t. Okay. However, if you add a very tiny bit of noise to the activation values before uh, going back as feedback to the neural net. So in other words, you make the network noisy. It can somehow cannot remember the past very well. Okay. So it cannot overfit as easily. And then suddenly, instead of T, it becomes log T, the number of samples. So you need less samples. Much less samples. And it also, it means that the network really cannot remember very well the past. Okay. And what's, can you give like an intuition yes. of why? One intuition is what I said is that the network cannot overfit because it doesn't have infinite precision. Yeah of the values that happened, be things that happened before. It has just a noisy memory, okay. and it becomes noisier when you go even uh, more steps uh, back. So your proposal is, let's just add like a tiny bit of noise in between all the time steps. Is there a particular property of recurrent neural networks, or is this for any neural network? Like, I can also imagine if I have a transformer or something, I just add a bit of noise between the layers. Is it similar or not? I, I think this particular analysis, we haven't uh, thought about transformers, but okay. other, uh, like you can use different activation values or, but for transformer, I, I haven't uh, thought about it. Really. Okay.
But in general, if someone trains a recurrent neural network, like it just what what do you mean by a tiny bit of noise? Like how how? So okay, so there is big? one message that uh, so this is sigma is the variance like the square root of the variance of the noise. Yeah. So let's say okay. So there is another message. So in real world, people implement neural nets. They don't have infinite precision for the values. Yeah. They have a floating point or an integer, like yeah, yeah, yeah. a number of bits, right? So if your noise is smaller than the amount of uh, precision that you can handle, yeah. then effectively the noise does not do anything, right? Because yes. it's so small yeah. that the value doesn't change, right? So let's say we pick sigma to be 10 to the negative 40. Yeah. So it, we don't... Uh, change anything because it's so small that uh, smaller than the precision yeah which means that real world neural networks are more more similar to this not not uh -huh, this. okay yeah so in theory people consider this to be the bound yeah because they said uh, real let's say networks are real value yes but here in this particular application of re recurrent neural nets it seems yeah. that it's very important to distinguish between finite precision and i see it and you, you think that order of noise that one would need is already on the order of, let's say, finite precision floating point arithmetic? That would be enough. It's still, okay. let's say, 10 to the negative 40. This yeah. becomes almost 40, uh, yeah. a constant. Okay. okay. Very cool. Very cool work. Thank you very much. Nice to, nice to meet you. Are Sorry, you? Will, I didn't record. We have to start again. But what we were saying so far is this is dictionary learning. We're trying to learn a dictionary from our items. Uh, so we can represent them using dictionary items and then sparse dictionary learning simply wants the dictionary to be sparse and k-means is really 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 similar uh, in terms of how you write it except different constraints on the matrix exactly so okay. here the rows of x will be standard basis that here so. um in the last bit of setup i don't know if you're familiar with print style streaming no where okay so this is a general very general streaming model where at each timestamp you can choose an arbitrary IJF entry of your data matrix and increment it or decrement it by a arbitrary amount delta. So mm -hmm. you can keep changing any one entry or and that goes on in the screen. But what why would why would someone this seems like a a nerfed version of gradient descent or so. No oh, or so is this training time or so this is just a streaming model. So like, say okay. you have tons of data coming through, you can't yeah. store all of it. Okay. Uh, so let's say you saw each entry one at a time, right? Yeah. And you couldn't store all the entries. Of uh, the data set. Yeah. yeah. So you want to somehow get algorithms that have low amount of space usage. Okay. Uh, and this is just a way we can say the data comes in over time. And by the data, you mean full data points or even individual feature elements of the data points so there are other streaming models like row streaming models or entry wise where like yeah. you get one entry at a time or one row at a time but this is more general than that because at each time you can increment or decrement like any entry of a yeah which means you could just that includes sending the entries one at a time okay or in order of rows or all of that do you have maybe an example for the problem set up like a typical example you know, if you're streaming data online, you know, petabytes of data or something like that, you can't store it all locally. Yeah. But then say like uh, the first one that comes in, you know, it says that the if user, their J feature goes up by 10. Okay. You know, that's one increment. Then later it goes down by three. And, you know, that's another time. And then, you know, this happens to all the entries in whatever arbitrary order. So could, could one real world example be i don't know netflix user ratings so you have users you have movies and then you say well this user gave five stars exactly and then but later maybe they watched it again and they they did that deducted one and then they watched another movie and so on okay exactly cool yeah. cool yeah right and so and then in just the broad overview is so both of these problems are np hard to solve exactly so first of all in this streaming model we can get uh, within a one plus epsilon approximate solution. So within the optimal costs um, with these upper bounds on the space complexity of the streaming algorithms. Mm -hmm. And do you know the algorithm or can you just show that there is an algorithm? We have an explicit algorithm. Uh, it's a bit hard to include and we were more interested in the complexity results. Yeah. So we didn't include it here. 
Uh, it still has high, so these streaming algorithms have high time complexity. They're more focused on the space needed. And then these, these two algorithms for these problems show that uh, you can get polynomial running time in the original matrix dimensions if you know, the parameters K and R are fixed. Mm -hmm. Except these do not work in the streaming algorithm. You need all of the data at once. So yeah. these are these two results. And then we also have a streaming space complexity lower bound to go with the k-means result to give some idea of you know, how tight our result is. Okay, mm -hmm. cool, very cool. And so what, yeah. what does this have to do with sketching? So the, on the technical side of these, the way we obtain these results are by balancing a bunch of different ideas from matrix sketching. Are you familiar yeah. with matrix uh, sketching? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, so you have beams like the johnson Lindenstrauss lemma mm -hmm. lets you take vectors in a high dimensional space, map them to a small one and preserve the pairwise distances. Yeah. You know, you can also reduce the dimensionality of a matrix to solve linear regression efficiently on a small matrix and get guarantees. Yeah. And if you look at like these two problems written it the way we do, they're like, okay, it kind of looks like linear regression if you knew or yeah, multilinear regression if you knew what X was. Um, and these errors in the Frobenius norm occur in you know, a Hilbert space or L2 space. So basically if you balance these guarantees in the correct way, you can greatly reduce the dimensionality of these problems in N or D. So they're logarithmic in those parameters. And once they're logarithmic in those parameters, you just brute force it, polynomial system solvers, or those kinds of things. Very cool, very cool. So what's the, if you had to summarize, like the message <laughs> as a result of this? Right, I would say it depends on what area you're working. If you yeah. practically want to, you know, use these algorithms, I think you would use the sketching reduction techniques, but then use a heuristic at the end instead of brute force. Yeah. You work on the theory for these algorithms. I think this gives you an idea of what theoretically is possible and not possible. Mm -hmm. And if you're just interested in, you know, how can you use sketching, matrix sketching ideas in your research, then this uh, gives a good example of how you can, you know, the, these things interplay to solve, you know, common problems. Yep. Okay. Very cool. Okay. Thanks all for the explanation. Thanks. Hello, oh, people. Hi. hi, I'm Yannick. Hi. Nice to meet you. I know your yeah, videos. Yeah, I've seen your videos. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, is it okay if I record a bit here? Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. course. Okay. Of course. Would you of course. tell people a bit what you, what you did yeah. in the research? Yeah. Yeah. And why the text is upside down? Yeah. Oh, that's equiv equivariant. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. nice. <laughs> so we actually saw this thing on Twitter. It was becoming viral at some point where people were complaining that uh, ChatGPT can't uh, predict like inverted text. Yeah. So so this in this work, we try to like solve that problem. Okay. Uh, so what we're trying to uh, deal with here is, uh, so let's say you're given a large patent model. How do you make that robust to transformations of the data? Yeah. And we, we show that even like the largest model like ChatGPT4, even that model is not uh, completely robust to uh, the transformations of the data. Like in this example, you have inverted image uh, and we ask it to kind of extract what's written in the image mm -hmm. and it, it can't do it. Uh, and we saw similar things with uh, another foundation model like segment anything model by Meta. Yeah. And we saw when we feed segment anything model with uh, images from MS Coco dataset and rotated, the performance drops quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's surprising because it's a huge model and it works really well in practice. Yeah. Uh, but when we feed the rotated image, it, it, it seems to like not perform uh, as well as we thought it would. And what is interesting it is that uh, for, like in mass Cartesian, the drop is a lot more compared to segment editing model. So there's definitely some emergence of equivalence with the scale. Uh, no, it's interesting, yeah. But still, um, still it's not able to like get complete equivalence. Uh, and here we try to solve that problem uh, without touching the pretrained model uh, because it's really expensive if we go and fine tune these models on like different mm -hmm. data augmentations. And many people will not have the resources to do that as well. Yeah. And we also don't want to from scratch train an equivariant model yeah. that yeah. has many architectural tricks that are costly to implement. Yeah, and, and makes such. sense. So, Yes, the strategy to make the model equivariant is to, on the side, train a small network that will canonicalize, so learn to transform the input in such a way that the input will be easy to process for the large pre-trained model. Yeah. So, so, yes, basically, 
we train a small network that outputs a transformation that is then applied on the input. So in this case, for example, the, transport, the transformation will turn the text upright, and then, of course, this will be able to be read by the, the backbone model. So, so the small one just needs to learn, like, where is up? Exactly. Or, or like, yes. how do I flip stuff so that it's yes, easier? Exactly. Does it get feedback from the other model? Or? Yes. So okay. it's trained without supervision, like yeah. only with supervision, like implicit supervision from the frozen big model. Basically, so we train this end to end, we freeze the, the big model. Yeah. And the small model is trained on the task, so on a fine tuning data set. Yeah. And basically, the small model wants to. Uh, solve the task as best as possible. So it gets gradient from the big model that will sort of make it learn transformations that will uh, be consistent for the big model. And so do you have the label during training time? Or no, no not uh, at all? We have so, only the task uh, information. Yeah, OK. So, uh, so add to that, uh, in this case, we actually don't even backpropagate to the large model. Yeah. Here we do like zero shot events. Yeah. So we essentially just learn to uh, say whenever the images are rotated, we learn to like bring it back to the upright orientation just using this one sim simple loss. Okay. Uh, which basically says that, uh, so like, so this is the equivalent architecture here, the canicalizer. So it basically says that whenever you input an oh. image here, like, Try to predict that uh, the transformation which you need to apply to this should be close to the identity transformation. So basically keep everything close to the upright images. Mm -hmm. So whenever you rotate this image, uh, this equivalent architecture will make sure that your, your distribution kind of shifts to the right orientation. Okay. And then you will, you will sample from that and you will rotate this thing back to the right orientation. Okay. And then you feed it through the network. So even with just this loss and just training this canicalizer separate from the large model, we were able to like get pretty impressive performance. Like we we have like complete equivalence in sample. Cool. And and, and we have like three percent, zero point three percent extra parameters and seven percent extra inference time in the whole yeah. pipeline. Yeah. Pretty neat. Um, so one argument could be made that if I show a human an upside down picture, they're also worse. And therefore, sh right. should these models even be as good on upside down images as on real images? I mean, that's right. a good question. That's a very good um, question. Yeah. I mean, so this work is actually inspired by how we human perceive things. Okay. Uh, so, for example, when I show you an inverted image of a cow, yeah. in your mind, you'll always try to like rotate it yeah. back to the right orientation yeah, yeah. to be able to perceive like what it is. And this <laughs> is not how intrinsically equivariant architectures work for the most part. Yeah. They will have rotated filters maybe, which will instantly like get the same features right. for every rotation of yeah. the image. So. Yeah. This is not really how we do it in a sense. So I think this is closer to what humans do. So that's why like an extension of this we're working on is getting rid of the equivalent architecture even from the canonicalizer. Yeah. And instead work on an optimization method where we learn to optimize and like get to that right orientation uh, through this first step in the pipeline. Okay. Awesome. That's very cool. Thanks a lot. Thank very you cool so work. Much. Thank nice you. to meet you. See you. Enjoy the conference. <laughs> you too. I'm, uh, I'm doing a bit of recording. Is it okay if I okay. record here? Sure. Okay. Uh, I think wait, I've, seen, I've too... seen your name previously. Have you, have you been in research for a while? 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> this, this one explains that. I'm Yannick. Hi. Oh, yeah. Nice Hi. Meeting you. I think we know a bit what multi head architectures are and what yes. cross task generalization is, but adapters. not the connection. Adapters, a little bit. What kind of adapters okay. do you? So the idea is uh, when you have a pre-trained model yeah. and, and then you have a new task coming in, uh, you want to fine-tune your model for that new task. Okay. And you can either fine-tune you know, all of the parameters of the model on that particular task or you try to fine-tune some subset of the parameters. And, and one of the most efficient ways to do so is to train what's called an adapter, which is basically some structured version of a subset of the parameters. So you can mm -hmm. maybe fine-tune a low-rank matrix yeah. and uh, through this particular new task. But even though the number of parameters in the adapter that's going to fine-tune that new task is far, far smaller than the total number of parameters, it's still pretty significant, like maybe a few million parameters. Now, if you're in the many-task setting, where you have like tens of thousands of tasks, yeah. you can't afford to train one separate adapter for each of these tasks. Yeah. So the question becomes, how do you... Um, share 
parameters across all of these tasks. Okay. So you want to do some kind of, of matrix factorization of adapters. So instead of having one adapter per task, you're going to have a basis of adapters. I see. And then yeah. for each task, you're going to learn the linear combination of that basis. I see. So it's like an adapter for adapters. Almost. It is some kind of adapter for adapters. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Um, now, you can do this. This has been done. Like There's this 2019 paper, uh, Billy Trapon, that does this. Yeah. And then when a new task comes in, you kind of have two choices. Either you... You've, you you assume that your basis of adapters is fixed and you only learn the, the, the weights of the linear combination. Yeah. Or you actually fine-tune the actual basis as well. I see. And it turns yeah. out that you kind of lose either way because if you only learn the, the weights of the linear combination, it actually doesn't perform as well as also fine-tuning the basis of the adapters. Mm -hmm. But then the whole point of the basis of adapters was that you would share yeah. this basis across all of the tasks. So now if you end up fine-tuning that basis for each task independently, you've kind of undone everything that you had. Yeah. So the whole point of this work is, can we basically navigate that spectrum into between just updating the weights of the linear combination and then fine-tuning all of the adapters? And the way we do this is through multi-head, which is instead of having um, the basis of adapters, we're going to take each adapter in that basis and then uh, chop it off mm -hmm. into chunks. And then we're going to learn, for each chunk, we're going to learn a linear combination for that particular chunk. Okay. So now my for each task, instead of having one set of linear combination coefficients, I have one set of linear combination coefficients for each chunk. Yes. So depending on how many chunks I cut my adapters into, I can get more or less flexibility for each of the tasks. I see. Yeah. And so what we show is this curve, where we basically vary the number of chunks in which we chop off the adapters, and as we cut into, as we uh, chop them off into more chunks, yeah, we have more parameters to adapt because, of course, we have more parameters per task. Yeah, but then we increase the accuracy. Okay. So we kind of gain. We offer this additional level of flexibility. On if you only have one chunk, this is basically equivalent to the point Japan 2019 paper. Yeah. We can have few parameters per task, but maybe not that much accuracy. And as you increase the number of chunks, you can increase the accuracy. And so now we can scale this to tens of thousands of tasks. Yeah. It's a reasonable number of, of adaptation parameters. Very cool. Do you think you're close to how humans adapt to tens of thousands of tasks or really far away and it's sort of limitations I, of how we do things in deep learning? I'm not a major proponent of trying to anthropomorphize the algorithms. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> It turns out to work well, whether this bears any, you know, cognitive resemblance with, yeah. with humans. I do not wish to answer that question. It, it, this was not done in that spirit, sure. so there's yeah. no reason for this to be any relationship. Is there any value in trying to kind of understand what the tasks are in terms of, you know, okay, these tasks might be related and therefore yes. I may be, you know, yes. share more stuff between them and so on? Or? So Yes. To compose them in some fashion. Yeah. So there's there's the you know there's the uh, old question of what is the uh, geometry of the space of tasks? What is the metric between yeah. tasks? Which tasks are related? Yeah. Um, in our case, we do not have any uh, textual description of a task. Okay. We basically have a bunch of inputs output example. Yes. Which we use to learn these these linear combination coefficients. Mm -hmm. So now one question could be. Based on these linear combination coefficients, can you actually derive some kind of similarity metric between tasks, and do they bear any semantic meaning? Uh, mm -hmm. This isn't. This is not an analysis we've we've done. Mm -hmm. But clearly, our approach in that sense does not necessarily leverage any prior information yes. about the task. And I there's something I haven't talked about, which is ex what we do, which is extremely naive and still still works well. Where basically we have all of our basis of adapters. And we show that by just uniformly averaging them, it still works quite well. Okay. And clearly, that's not something you yeah, want to do. Yeah. You kind of want only want to pick the adapters that are related to the tasks you care yeah. about. Uh, and we don't have that information. But yeah, there's still a whole lot more to do about understanding what, what these tasks, which one positively correlate, which one negatively correlate. Did you algorithmically generate the, all the 10,000 tasks if you, if you test on so many tasks? So no, you, on that paper, from? we have fewer tasks. They come from standard uh, benchmarks. Okay. The 10,000 tasks come from another project, which is not part of that paper, okay. uh, which is a, a Microsoft-specific project. Uh, so I can't really say more about this. All right. Uh, <laughs> but no, they're not actually generated. They are real tasks. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very cool. much. Cool. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Good luck. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Yannick. 
I'm Nick. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. I'm Yanni. Yeah. I'm doing a bit of reporting from the conference. Oh, Is cool. it okay if I record here? Yeah, please. Okay. So how do you adapt pre-trained models while being aware of the geometry? Yes. Or maybe what is it for? Yeah. Who would want to do that? Yes, the idea is usually in classification, we kind of wrongly make the assumption that all of the classes are completely unrelated. But oftentimes there are relationships between the classes. Yeah. Like two classes like cats and dogs might be more similar than like cat and like VW bus, right? Yeah. So oftentimes you have uh, what's called metric space information about the classes. Okay. And so... You assume this is given somehow. Yeah, we assume that we, we have access to this somehow. Yeah. And uh, what we do is we take pre-trained models and we replace just taking the argmax over the softmax outputs mm -hmm. with a weighted average in the metric space where the weights come from the magnitudes of the softmax. Okay. And so that instead allows us to navigate throughout the metric space and derive a prediction that uses the geometry of the metric space as well. The, the weights of the softmax intensities of the different classes, yeah. but then you have to modulate that somehow or yeah, with the so, geometric information. Yeah, so you just you plug that into this uh, this thing called the uh, fresh Amy. Mm -hmm. And so this is a generalization of averages to metric spaces. And so, for example, with air quality index, if you had um, a binary classifier that could predict the best and the worst air quality, and you had this path graph that represents the relationships between the different categories, yeah. then uh, using our technique, you can, instead of just predicting the endpoints, you can actually use the weights of the softmax to navigate these intermediate points okay. as well. And this generalizes to any metric space. I so see. we could also use it for image now. So ImageNet has a metric uh, that we can derive from the WordNet hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can just use the shortest path distance on that graph. And uh, using that, you can also apply our method to ImageNet. We found that it improves over just using the argmax to derive outlets. I mean, many people don't know this, I think, but ImageNet actually comes with a hierarchy yes. on the labels, right? Right, right. So let's, but you still take a pre-trained classifier that's on whatever the thousand classes. Yes. And you, you just, you just have a, by using the WordNet hierarchy, you can improve the predictions mm -hmm. at without touching the model. That's right. That's okay. Right. By no, simply no taking the the fresh and mean according to the distances yeah and so in what i'm confused in this case you pr you have a two class output right, right but you somehow manage to predict different classes from it exactly do you do the same in ImageNet, where you have a thousand classes but you are able to predict more than that or do you simply improve the accuracy on these thousand classes uh so uh, both potentially. So we have experiments where we just use all of the classes. Yeah. And then uh, here we also have experiments in which we randomly select a subset of the ImageNet classes. And okay. we, uh, we're then able to uh, improve upon just uh, predicting the arc Yeah, I've, I've a little... Yeah, the, the, the confusion I think is... So if you take a subset of the classes, right. do you then predict also the classes that you don't ah, have in the subset? No, no. Or only the ones in yeah, the subset? Yeah, so that's, that's a drawback of the argmax, is that yeah. you, you can't actually predict. Like, for this example, yeah. you can only predict the endpoints. Exactly. Yeah, and so you're, you're limited in that sense. With the argmax, but with your technique, I'm not. Yeah. So you would take 250 classes of ImageNet, yeah. but then... The average might turn out to be one of the classes that's not in the 250 classes. Yeah. yeah. And then you can potentially predict more. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Exactly. And we have a bunch of theoretical results characterizing these like intermediate classes. Yeah. Um, and a set of all of these intermediate classes is something called the locus of the fresh mean. And okay. that's our technique is called Loki, and that's where the name comes from. I see. Yeah. I mean, we started out with saying sometimes we have this geometric information and so on. Yeah. Is there particular real-world domains where that's, you know, very common? Yeah, so, um, well, uh, it's certainly common in computer vision. Yeah. Right? Um, and anything in which uh, your classes have, I guess, any time you can assi assign, like, a, a name uh, mm -hmm. to your classes, you can always get, like, 
word embeddings yes. uh, and create a metric space using that. Okay. And so we did that for a lot of our experiments here. Um, another example is uh, if you have spatial classes. Mm -hmm. So for those uh, scenarios, you can uh, create grids. Yeah. And those can also uh, serve as a metric. Okay. And so we analyze that theoretically as well. So what is it that you actually need here? Like. If if we if we think about this in code, mm -hmm. what 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 do I need to give you as like a function or something to make this happen? Um, so let's say we have an ImageNet classifier, right? It outputs right. The, the 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 distribution over classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you need additionally? Yeah, the only other thing you need is the distance matrix that okay. relates all of the classes. Yeah. And if you have that. You can, like, it's so simple to apply this. All you would need to do is create the negative square of the distance matrix. Mm -hmm. And then whenever you have a softmax, a softmax vector, you just do a matrix vector product. And then you take the argmax of that, and that's equivalent to this. Yes. Okay. Yeah. One question I would have is, can you also use it for training? Is that mm. reinforcement learning is often the case where you have like multiple classes for a regression target. Right. This would be that. Right, right. Uh, yes, you, you could use this for training. Uh, we didn't, uh, but we, uh, I believe we tried a little bit and it didn't seem to improve it that much. So mm. actually, you don't need training. Okay. Yeah, mm. um, but you certainly could because like this is all like differentiable, right? Another thing that we've been thinking about is learning the distances, but we didn't do that in this paper. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Thank nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. We were reeled in. I have not looked at the, at the paper. Okay. Do you want me to walk you through? We, I think we know a little bit what feature shift is and what adversarial learning is, but we don't know how it goes together. Let me give you the motivation and why we did this. Yeah. So mainly, there are two main applications where this is useful. You can imagine sensor data. So you have, let's say, 10 rooms, and at each room you have a different sensor. Mm -hmm. And you want to check if some sensor starts malfunctioning, right? And then like these 10 sensors will form a 10-dimensional vector. And you will have a data set of, let's say, the, tens the sensor readings from yesterday, and these the sensor readings from today. Mm -hmm. And you want to check if there is some shift between them, because maybe the sensor broke or something is happening. Mm -hmm. This is like one application. The other one is you have a data set from, let's say, Hospital A and another data set from Hospital B. You know that the data from Hospital A is quite good, but the one from Hospital B might be wrong. There may be some problems on coding on how the data is standardized. And you want to detect those problems and maybe try to fix them. Mm -hmm. right? And all of those fall into the sort of feature shift problem. Right? This reference X follows a distribution P. This query y follows a distribution q, and basically we just do a, an heuristic, an iterative heuristic, trying to find which features might be originating the the shift. And basically, what we do is we train a binary classifier. In this case, it's a random forest. We just train it in the same way that you do in dance to classify between real and fake. Here, we do it to classify between reference and query. And you train it on those two things or on another reference data on set? On those two things. Yeah, we, we do like some cross validation splits so we yeah. don't overlap between what we train and, and process. But yeah, it's only using these this two data. And what are, how can we interpret like rows and columns? Is every square a data point or is. So every column is a feature. Yeah. Like you can imagine yeah. blood pressure, uh, BMI, yeah. age, okay. sex. And then it draws the sample, like patient yes. one, patient two, etc. The way we do it is we use a we use classifiers with built-in feature importances. So random forest has the Gini uh, score. If they don't have it, you can use some of these fancy methods that give you feature importance. It's quite simple. We just take the feature importance from the classifier. Mm -hmm. We have some heuristics to select the the ones that are quite high, and we remove those features. The rationale is that if that feature is important to discriminate between datasets. It probably indicates that there is a shift on that feature between data sets. Then we remove it um, and then we iterate the process. We keep iterating until basically the balance accuracy of the classifier becomes random chance. Mm -hmm. um, we have some theoretical framework where we show that you can relate this accuracy to the distribution shift between the P and Q that are distributions from X and Y and also related to the sort of mutual information that justifies the feature importance methods. 
and sort of all of it ties together. And at the end, basically, we end up with a data set with, where we have removed all the features that are corrupted, and therefore we know the, the locations that were corrupted. Mm -hmm. And for many tasks, like here, you're done. Like you have find these problems, maybe you fix them, or you you can keep going on. And then there are some other applications where you might want to like these features that are incorrect. You might want to provide some values, so the shift is gone. Let's say you want to do a medical study. You have data set um, from hospital A, from hospital B. The one from hospital A is very big and you really want to keep all information. And the one on the, uh, hospital B, you want to more or less fix the problems you found and keep it so you can have the combined data. And here again, we do another iterative OST. So we obtain a bunch of proposals and those are values that we sample from the reference X so let's say we detected that the BMI column and the age column were incorrect. Then we mm. sample those columns from the reference, which we know they are correct, or at least we assume they are correct. We perform a lot of permutations, and then we, add, we end up with many proposals, like thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. We replace those proposals to each of the samples. So we take patient one, we, re we replace each proposal for the values, and then we evaluate each different possible combination with another discriminator. Again, the discriminator is trained to classify between X and Y. Mm -hmm. Initially, you will put the sample and say it's Y, like it was correct. But some of those will have very high probability of being from the reference panel. And then basically you end up with your correct sample. You repeat the process, you retrain the classifier many times, the theory behind it, it becomes more or less the same as the ones behind GANs. So this is a discriminator. This, this heuristic, you can see it as a GAN, which it's actually not trained, so you only have a discriminator. And at the end, you have this basically sort of corrected data set. And we did some evaluation with many tabular data sets and biomedical data sets. This is for the localization task. And so this is F1 score, higher the better. Data fix is our technique, and we surpass all the other previous methods. And these ones on the right were the previous state of the art on feature localization. And this is for feature correction. And this was a little bit more challenging to evaluate because there is not an established way on how you evaluate this sort of application. And we use these hence Penrose diversions, which you can estimate empirically. So the lower the diversions, the better was your correction. And again, this dot here, it's our, our method data fix, and we surpass many of the other techniques, which are mainly imputation techniques, data alignment techniques, and we have some optimal transport yeah. techniques that we can with. I'm wondering, the metrics here, what does this exactly say about the classifier? Like the F1 of what? So this is the F1 of, after you have detected these positions, yeah. basically, how many, it basically says how many positions did you get correct? Yeah. Like fr from, because we are simulating the, the shifts, right? So mm -hmm. we have the grant. Like we create a query and we shift, let's say, 10 features. Yeah. And then if we detect all those 10 features, then we are, you know, we have 100% accuracy. Like okay. And if becomes... you detect too many, it would go down. Exactly. And if you detect too few, it would also go yeah. down. So you get the true positives, the false yeah. negatives, etc. Okay. And from that, you compute the F1. This is the average across many data sets, yeah. many shift types. We, you know, that we have uh, marginal shifts, label shifts, covariant shifts, like a bunch of different um, nature of shifts. And this is just the average across mm -hmm. all of them. And then here... So here, what we do is, after we have corrected this data set, yeah we compare this data set with the reference one. Well. But yeah, the, my question is how, like if I see you have some proposals to fill in and so on, if I were just to copy paste X here, what, what would my score be in this spot? Well, so if you copied the whole X, yeah. the whole thing, yeah. you have like zero diversions. Yeah. But here is the trick. You only want to replace the columns that were wrong, yeah. right? The, the the other ones yeah, you yeah. want to keep them yeah. as they were because you want to have them. Yeah. Information. No, no, that's that's fair. Like I was just wondering yeah. what exactly we measure. So this measures essentially how equal it is, and yeah. your constraint is that you only fill in the ones that you need to fill exactly. in. Exactly. Okay. And 
in some cases, let's say that those features were actually completely uncorrelated with all the other features, are yeah. completely independent. Then if you took those columns from the reference yeah. and you copied them as they were, yeah. that would be a perfect correction because yeah, yeah. they were completely independent. The marginal will match completely. You mm -hmm. are done. The yeah. trick is when you know it has a more difficult distribution and a more difficult shift. Yeah. When you compare to the other ones here, what's the what's the the basis? Is it does this include detecting the correct columns, or is it just how well you fill in after you know which ones are the correct ones? Because it could be that all of this performance just comes from the fact that you're better at detecting. That that's a great question. So for evaluating this, we assume that we already know the ground rules. Okay. okay. So we don't take into account the yeah. errors yeah. in those by these. So this is pure what values you fill in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Very nice. Yeah. So you thought that could catch you out, but <laughs> you did think about this. Very nice. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for coming. By. Thank you. And feel free to come to. So he's believing. Oh, you're, you're believing. believing. Yeah. I mean, we had this paper that you know, it's nice. We put some theory. It's it works well. Yeah. But it's you know an heuristic with random forest. Yeah. And this got accepted, and we did like a huge neural network, fancy state of the art newest thing and it got rejected so it ended up in a workshop and we're like come on uh, oh well oh well that's life yeah. cool oh thanks a lot yeah, thank okay. one quick question how many iterations do you need to do for the correction like, typically so for the correction actually um, it depends on what you define iterations so we process the each sample independently and then we retrain these um, once in a while uh, but once we have processed all the samples, usually we stop there because usually it has been corrected. In just in many small cases, we still detect some diversions and we repeat going through all the samples again. Here, it is a lot of iterations. Usually, as many iterations as corrupted features are. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's for the wild set Hofreiter. Okay, one thing you can be sure at NeurIPS is that there's always, always, always banded algorithms. Always. Hi. Hi. Awesome to meet you, man. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm you book, but, yeah. um, not, not, not too much. Not? Thank you very much. Very, very kind. Yeah. I was saying, there's always an uh, entire section of banded algorithms, and they just don't die. Hey, are you authors here? Oh, uh, no. No, okay. <laughs>